In the world of Formula One, speed, precision, and danger collide on the racetrack. Jules Bianchi, a rising star, lived life in the fast lane. But one fateful day, the world of motorsport would witness a horrifying tragedy. As rain poured down and visibility dwindled, Bianchi found himself in a nightmare scenario during the Japanese Grand Prix. The conditions were treacherous, and the clock was ticking. In those terrifying last minutes, the line between triumph and tragedy blurred. But what happened in those heart-stopping moments? What decisions were made and what forces conspired against him? Join us as we journey through the remarkable life of Jules Bianchi, a tale of speed, triumph, and the haunting echoes of a Formula One race that would change everything. Jules Bianchi was born on August 3, 1989 in Nice, France. Racing was in his blood as he was born into a family deeply rooted in motorsport. His grandfather, Mauro Bianchi, was a successful driver in the 1960s and 1970s, and he won the World Sports Car Championship in 1968. Moreover, Jules was the grandnephew of Luciano Bianchi, Mauro's brother, a respected figure in Formula One, who achieved success in 19 Grand Prix races between 1959 and 1968, and triumphed at the 1968 24 Hours of Le Mans. Sadly, Luciano passed away during testing for Le Mans the next year. Given this racing heritage, it came as no surprise that young Bianchi had his first experience behind the wheel at the remarkably young age of three. A passion facilitated by his father, who owned a kart track. His father remembers, Jules only had one thing in mind. As soon as his feet touched the pedals, he wanted to climb into a kart. Karting on the family track, he soon became addicted to the speed. His early start in karting paid off as he progressed through the ranks and achieved second place in both the French and European Junior Championships in 2004. When he turned 18, he made the switch from karting to the competitive arena of French Formula Renault 2.0 under SG Formula. His debut was nothing short of extraordinary as he clinched the championship with five stellar victories. Not stopping there, he also showcased his skills in the Formula Renault Euro Cup. Securing a pole position and fastest lap in three gripping races. Transitioning to the Formula 3 Euro Series in late 2007, Bianchi inked a deal with ART Grand Prix. The year 2008 proved a defining one as he triumphed at the Masters of Formula 3 and secured an impressive third place in the overall 2008 Formula 3 Euro Series. His career had gained significant momentum, and he caught the attention of none other than Ferrari, who recruited him as the first person for their Formula One Young Driver program. The program has a very clear goal, to help youngsters develop to the point where, one day, they could fly the Ferrari flag in the Formula One World Championship, according to the team principal. Moving into 2012, Ferrari loaned Bianchi to the Sahara Force India team, where he embraced the role of test and reserve driver. His skill and dedication were clearly on display, showcased during numerous Friday free practice sessions. This experience helped him make a smooth transition from GP2 to Formula 1, providing valuable hands-on experience behind the wheel of a Formula 1 car. Debuting at the Australian Grand Prix, Bianchi demonstrated his talent by securing a 15th place finish, a notable achievement for a rookie driver. However, his breakthrough moment came at the Monaco Grand Prix, when he piloted the Marussia car to a remarkable ninth place finish, earning the team its first ever world championship points. His remarkable performance earned him the title of Autosport Rookie of the Year in 2013, and it was clear that Bianchi had made a strong impression from the beginning of his career. Will you be Formula One world champion? <laughs> For sure I won't. And um, I will do all what I can to, to become one one day. And if I can't, I would have uh, no regrets. As the 2014 season unfolded, Jules Bianchi's impressive performances continued. Amidst challenges and retirements, he consistently outperformed his teammate, solidifying his position as the primary driver. Bianchi's journey was one of talent, resilience, and an unwavering determination to conquer the world of racing. On October 2, 2014, Amid growing speculation that Fernando Alonso might leave Ferrari for McLaren, Bianchi expressed his readiness to join Ferrari. He stated, I have been working towards that goal since I joined the academy at the end of 2009. So, now I did nearly two seasons in Formula One and I think I have good experience and I feel ready for that, for sure. Tragically, he could not have foreseen the fate that awaited him just three days later. On that fateful day, October 5th, 2014, the Suzuka circuit bore witness to the Japanese Grand Prix, 
amidst the looming threat of typhoon fanfone and the dimming light of dusk. The weather was tumultuous, with intermittent heavy rainfall amplifying the challenges. The event kicked off with a safety car leading the way for the first two laps, navigating the challenging circuit in the face of the relentless downpour. However, the race was soon red flagged due to the relentless weather conditions halting the proceedings. Despite the rough weather, after a pause, the race resumed, but the track remained soaked and slippery from the earlier heavy rainfall, posing a new set of difficulties for the drivers. As the race progressed to lap 43, disaster struck. In the S-curves section of the track, there was a semi-dry racing line. However, as the cars reached the final part of the corner sequence known as Dunlop Curve, the racing line narrowed due to water flowing onto the track. Sauber driver Adrian Suttel encountered this flowing water, lost control of his car, and collided with the retaining wall at the corner's exit. While Suttel escaped unharmed, his car needed to be recovered. The standard procedure was followed, with a recovery vehicle or snatch tractor dispatched to pick up Suttel's damaged car and move it to a safe location. Track marshals were present to clear debris, repair barriers, and assist in the recovery operation. To ensure the safety of track workers and warn other drivers of the danger ahead, double-waved yellow flags were displayed. These flags indicate that drivers must reduce speed and be prepared to stop if necessary, and overtaking is prohibited. Jules Bianchi, who had been just ahead of Sutil when he veered off the track, returned to the scene one lap later. He was shown the double-waved yellow flags because Sutil's car was still in the process of being recovered. However, for reasons that remain unclear, Bianchi did not slow down sufficiently under the double-waved yellow flags. It became evident that an accident was highly likely from this point, but there was still a chance to avoid it or reduce its severity. As Bianchi's car approached the same patch of water that had caused Sutil's incident, he lost control of his vehicle, much like Sutil had. Bianchi overcorrected the car, which had lost rear grip and it veered off the track towards the location of the recovery operation. A collision was now inevitable. It was a matter of what the Marussia car would hit and how hard. During the two seconds Bianchi's car left the track and crossed the runoff area, there was still an opportunity to avoid the recovery vehicle. Bianchi attempted to brake, but the front wheels locked, making steering impossible. Additionally, he also applied the throttle, in this situation, the engine should have automatically shut off due to a safety system called Failsafe, present in all 2014 F1 cars. Failsafe is a software algorithm that overrides the throttle and cuts the engine in such scenarios. Unfortunately, Marusha's brake-by-wire system was incompatible with the Failsafe, preventing the engine from shutting off. It's possible that Bianchi was distracted by the unfolding events, the locked front wheels, and was unable to steer the car to avoid the crane. According to the FIA report, had Bianchi properly slowed down for the double-waved yellow flags, refrained from overcorrecting the steering, and lifted off the throttle in the final two seconds before impact, the accident could have been avoided or its severity reduced. The severity might also have been lessened if the failsafe system had functioned as intended. Tragically, Bianchi's car collided with the engine cover and left rear wheel of the 6.5 metric ton recovery vehicle with minimal reduction in speed. The impact was so forceful that the crane was partly lifted off the ground, causing Sudel's Sauber, suspended by the crane, to plummet back to the track. The collision caused substantial damage to his composite chassis car, ripping off the roll hoop and air box, and striking Bianchi's helmet. The magnitude of the blow and the glancing nature of it caused massive head deceleration and angular acceleration, leading to severe injuries. Bianchi, unconscious and unresponsive to communications via team radio or marshals, received immediate attention at the crash site. He was swiftly transported by ambulance to the Suzuka Circuit's medical center. Adverse weather conditions ruled out helicopter transport, and for 32 grueling minutes under police escort, Bianchi was taken to the nearest hospital in Yokaichi, about 9.3 miles away from the Suzuka Circuit. Reports from Bianchi's father indicated the seriousness of the situation. The statement explains that Bianchi has suffered a diffuse axonal injury and has undergone a successful three-hour operation on his brain to alleviate a subdural hematoma. On the day after the incident, FIA medical delegate Matteo Bonassini announced that Bianchi remains in a critical but stable condition. 
Diffuse axonal injuries are a serious but common type of traumatic brain injury. Severe head injuries often have a low survival rate. Among those who do survive, a significant portion remain unconscious and never recover consciousness. Of the lucky few that do regain consciousness, many face long-term issues even after undergoing rehabilitation. The motorsport community anxiously awaited news, collectively wishing for the best outcome for Jules Bianchi during this difficult time. Following Bianchi's critical emergency surgery, his father provided the first family update during the week starting October 13, 2014. Bianchi's condition was described as desperate by doctors, deeming his survival a miracle. Despite the gravity of the situation, his father found hope in Michael Schumacher's recovery from a coma, openly sharing this sentiment. Interestingly, Schumacher had been Bianchi's childhood hero, and now tragically, Bianchi shared a similar fate. During his hospitalization, Bianchi remained in a critical yet stable state requiring a medical ventilator. In November 2014, he emerged from his induced coma, starting to breathe without assistance. This improvement allowed his transfer to France. Though still unconscious and in a critical state, this relocation brought him closer to his family, enabling them to maintain a daily vigil. His father shared, Neurologically, the doctors told us that there is no specific intervention to do. Most importantly, to stimulate Jules is that he feels a constant presence at his side. That's why we take turns every day, his mother, his sister, his brother, and me. Also, Jules' girlfriend who lives here now. From time to time at his bedside, we see that things are happening. At times he is more active, he moves more, his hand shakes. But is it mere reflex reactions or real? That is hard to know. On July 17th, 2015, at the age of 25, Jules Bianchi passed away. Jules fought right to the very end as he always did, but today his battle came to an end, said the Bianchi family. The pain we feel is immense and indescribable. Bianchi's passing marked a somber milestone, making him the first Formula One driver to lose his life from injuries sustained in a Grand Prix since the tragic loss of Ayrton Senna in 1994. To this day, no driver has died behind the wheel of a Formula One car. The funeral service took place at Nice Cathedral on July 21, 2015. The service saw a multitude of drivers, past and present, paying their respects, a testament to Bianchi's impact on the racing world. After his passing, the FIA has announced that car number 17 will no longer be used in the Formula One World Championship as a mark of respect to Jules Bianchi. Current Formula One star Charles Leclerc was deeply saddened by the tragic loss of his godfather, Jules Bianchi. Their bond went beyond the realm of mentorship. It was a relationship that had shaped Charles's career in ways he could never have imagined. In the early days of his junior racing career, Charles faced a pivotal moment when his father found himself unable to continue funding his son's karting races. The dream of becoming a racing driver was slipping away due to financial constraints. However, in this critical juncture of his career, Jules Bianchi emerged as a guardian angel. At the end of 2011, I had to quit motorsport because my father, unfortunately, no longer had the means to pay for my career, Charles recalled, his voice filled with gratitude and melancholy. But luckily, there was Jules, who was my godfather, who helped me a lot. Bernie Ecclestone, Formula One Group CEO, stated, It was so sad to hear the news about Jules. We are now going to miss a very talented driver and a really nice person. We must not let this ever happen again. In May 2016, the Bianchi family announced their intention to pursue legal action against the FIA, Bianchi's former Marisha team, and Bernie Ecclestone's Formula One group. We seek justice for Jules and want to establish the truth about the decisions that led to our son's crash at the Japanese Grand Prix in 2014, his father said. As a family, we have so many unanswered questions and feel that Jules's accident and death could have been avoided if a series of mistakes had not been made. In the wake of Jules Bianchi's tragic accident, the FIA wasted no time launching an investigation and exploring potential safety improvements. Jules Bianchi's incident prompted immediate action and considerations for alterations. The FIA published a report outlining multiple contributing factors to the accident, including track conditions, car speed, and the presence of the recovery vehicle on the circuit. The FIA suggested numerous safety enhancements for the recovery of stricken vehicles, 
which were subsequently implemented for the 2015 season. However, the report concluded that modifying cockpit design would not have prevented Bianchi's injuries. It also highlighted that Bianchi had engaged both the throttle and brake, which typically shuts off engine power. Unfortunately, Marussia's brake-by-wire system was incompatible with the failsafe, preventing the engine from shutting off. Despite this, Marussia was not held accountable for the accident, but the tragic accident did mark a turning point in Formula One safety protocols. For the 2015 season, the FIA introduced regulations specifying that no race could start less than four hours before sunset or dusk, except in official night races. These revised regulations impacted the start times of several Grand Prix races, including those in Australia, Malaysia, China, Japan, and Russia. Subsequently, significant safety measures were implemented, notably the virtual safety car and the Halo, aimed at enhancing driver protection and minimizing risks on the track. The Halo's primary role is to shield the driver's head from large airborne debris and offer protection in scenarios where cars collide or when a car directly impacts a safety vehicle, a circumstance tragically illustrated by Bianchi's accident. Its introduction was initially met with controversy when it debuted in 2018. Despite initial hesitations, the Halo has now emerged as a vital safety component in Formula One cars. It has proven its worth by saving lives in various racing categories, including Formula 1, Formula 2, and Formula 3. Sadly, the Halo probably wouldn't have saved Jules Bianchi's own life. According to the FIA's own evaluation, the Halo device would not have been effective in saving Bianchi in his tragic accident. This assessment is grounded in the understanding that the Halo might not have maintained its structural integrity against the substantial lateral forces experienced during the impact. Additionally, considering the severe impact, the entire roll hoop of Bianchi's car was sheared off, including the airbox, which plays a critical role in enhancing structural strength. Ultimately, Bianchi's injury resulted from the rapid deceleration that caused his brain to collide with the interior of his skull. Given the halo's inherent rigidity, it might not have effectively absorbed the impact energy, potentially yielding a similar tragic outcome. Luckily, the Halo did save lives since its introduction. An exemplary incident highlighting the Halo's effectiveness occurred during the 2020 Bahrain Grand Prix involving Romain Grosjean. His Haas car suffered a severe crash that led to the car splitting in two and bursting into flames. Miraculously, Grosjean survived with only second-degree burns to his hands thanks to the Halo protecting his head during the crash. Jules Bianchi saved my life thanks to the Halo, and I was absolutely against its introduction. What an idiot I was! Jules saved my life and the lives of other drivers, and I will always be grateful to him for that," Grosjean said. Following that crash, Bianchi's mother acknowledged the significance of the Halo in a heartfelt message, emphasizing how glad she is this innovation saved Grosjean's life in the accident. Though his life was tragically cut short, Jules Bianchi's legacy lives on in the hearts of millions. In the world of motorsport, Bianchi will forever remain a cherished and enduring symbol of determination, talent, and unwavering passion.